Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest in our IFG live series. Uh, despite the Prime Minister's admonitions, we should all be back in the office. We are still all uh, doing this virtually. So welcome to our virtual event. And today we're going to look at the media's coverage of coronavirus. Uh, what's gone well, what's gone not so well, and how difficult has it been for those trying to bring the news of this uh, global pandemic to you. So I'm delighted to be joined by a top panel. Um, my panel consists of Evan Davis, who is a presenter of BBC's PM. He is the presenter of BBC's PM, which goes out between five and six uh, every day. But during the crisis, I actually had an extended edition uh, for a while from 4.30 to six. Then we have Kate McCann. Kate is the Chief Political Correspondent of Sky News. We have Jen Williams, Political and Investigations Editor of the Manchester Evening News. And last but not least, Tom Newton Dunn. Tom is now Chief Political Commentator on Times Radio, which made the very brave decision to get going during the uh, coronavirus crisis, but actually covered what you might call the sort of phase one of the crisis, so the sort of early stages of March through to uh, beginning of June as political editor of The Sun. So delighted to be joined by them. I'm Jill Rutter. I'm a senior fellow at the Institute for Government. We have a facility to allow you to ask questions. So please, please, please post some questions. I've got some questions of my own that we're going to kick off with. And uh, then we will get going and uh, and take some of those and see how it all goes along. So I'm going to kick off, uh, first of all, with a question uh, and I will start with Evan. Evan, you know, what's sort of been the sort of in covering this? What's been the sort of biggest challenge and what do you think actually looking back you'll be thinking, well, actually we we never managed to really get that right or we sort of stumbled at the at the start because this was really such a new thing we had to deal with. What's actually been the hardest thing to do oh, in could, coronavirus? Evan. I, could, I could pick lots of things there. So there's the coverage of statistics and giving context to those. There's the pace at which coronavirus has evolved. We're doing daily programmes trying to give a kind of uh, a, a 100 meter sprint commentary of coronavirus, while actually it's more like a test match. It's been evolving quite slowly. But the one I would pick, Jill, is politics. I would bet that all the participants in this panel have had correspondence or emails or tweets criticizing their coverage as being either, either insufficiently holding power to account and getting at the government and it's a useless response to this and killing people, or disloyally questioning the government at a time of crisis when we should all be putting together. And finding the balance between those, I think, has been quite difficult. It's been more difficult because we entered this with the, the Brexit veil over our politics, in which a lot of people had prior views about what Boris Johnson's government was like and hated it, um, and others obviously liked it. And I think, it's, I think it's shown up in some of the media coverage where I think there has been a danger of our adversarial culture in media, there has been a danger at times where the press have wrongly allowed themselves to look as though, or elements of the press, um, in their desire to, if you like, point out what's going wrong in care homes or the lack of testing or the challenge over PPE, have allowed it to look like they're actually, to, to some in the audience at least, that they're actually delighting in the failures of the government. Um, and I, I, for me, a lot of that has been around the, the fact that we have a very political culture in our journalism. So we have covered this to some extent as a political story. We didn't at the beginning of this say, OK, poll cause, you can all go home. Psy cause, you can come in now. It's a science story. You're going to dominate the questions at the daily briefing and you're going to run the show. It was very much more a political story. And... I, I, I think it's really, really difficult because I think there are times where the coverage has looked as though 60,000 excess deaths is a story because it shows us that Boris Johnson hasn't handled it well, rather than 60,000 excess deaths is a, a lot of, you know, national trauma. And so for me, that whole issue of politics and how it plays and how we 
get the balance right between pointing out the errors of the government and between not dwelling on politics at a time when something really big is happening in the country that isn't all about politics. That for me has been one of the big challenges. And, you know, I think we've all struggled with it to some extent. And I know that we've all had, I'm sure, had, you know, complaints about the way we've handled it. So, Evan, uh, just to pick you up on that point about covering the political story, which in a sense is also a sort of criticism of some of the way in which the BBC handled Brexit, that they saw it as a political who's up, who's down story rather than uh, actually this is about the long term future of the UK and our economic and security relationship with the EU. It's very notable that the BBC usually sends Laura Kunzberg when we had those briefings, who's inevitably going to see it through a political lens rather than Indeed. your science editors, or your medical editors. Was that much discussed in the BBC? Actually, you know, should we be treating this as a political story? The moment you get Laura there, you obviously get Robert Peston there. I'm going to come on to Kate because Beth Rigby has also been making quite a bit of a name for herself at those briefings. Do the BBC sort of sit and say, actually, are we sending the right people? Are we treating this story in the right way? Well, there's there's a lot of internal discussion. And I'm sure in the latter days, I don't know how they decide who goes and does the BBC question of these things. I'm sure in the latter days there has been a lot of, is it Hugh Pym's turn or is it Laura's turn or, or, or David Shookman today? And so I'm sure there has been a lot of discussion about that. But I think... And I don't think the BBC is an outlier on this. The default in our culture is if the prime minister is there, the political correspondent's there. If the president of the US is there, the US political, the US editor is there. It's just we, we, we default to political coverage in this country. And, uh, and that, that is just the way we, we do stuff. Now, I'm, I, I don't know how similar it is in, in other countries, but it does mean that the frame in which we're covering it is very political. And I'll just give you a, an example of what I mean. So Boris Johnson says something, we're going to have a world beating mm -hmm. test and trace system. OK, he uses that word world beating. Now, I think this is I, I, I put this in for discussion. I think most of the public know how to interpret the word world beating. This is a piece of, you know, basically rhetoric by a prime minister, probably not literally true and not worth giving much time to it. But of course, if, you're, if your whole frame is around political accountability, which is obviously very important, mm. then your judgment about test and traces, is it world beating? And we've had quite a lot of coverage about is it world beating? And I'm gonna, you know, I'm not breaking news here. It isn't world beating. It wasn't going to be world beating by this point. And we don't need to sort of waste much of our listeners and viewers and readers time debating whether it's world beating. You only want to debate whether it's world beating if you're trying to work out whether Boris Johnson exaggerates or mm. Boris Johnson says stuff that is, you know, a little bit puffy for the for the true circumstances. And I, you know, I think most of the public already have a view on whether Boris Johnson might say stuff that is, you know, a bit of an exaggeration. They don't need that to be the centre of our coverage. The coverage maybe should be focusing more on the substance of how test and trace is doing, where the weaknesses are, where the strengths are. And so I just I do think the political frame mm. has affected the coverage. And 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 you know my my gut instinct is maybe a little bit too much. But I I, I honestly I'm very open minded about this. I think mm. it's a really tricky balance to get right. But the, the the truth is we default to political coverage in this country. And when this came along, that was the natural thing to do. That's how we do it. And we might want to look back and say, how would different it would have been if the science correspondents had been in the lead or the health correspondent? It, and, you know, I may be being unfair here, but, I, but that's my that's my sense of it. Really. So that's very interesting. I want to go to Kate. Kate, uh, you know, your political correspondent, Sky News, your colleague Beth Rigby has uh, has been called out by some people for having a bit too much of a sort of gotcha mentality along with some of the other people who turn up at press conferences. Do you recognise the sort of issue that Evan is raising that this is sort of too much about uh, about can we catch the Prime Minister out? Is he making a mistake? Is Matt Hancock really flailing around with the wrong number of tests and things like that rather than focusing on the substance? Kate? I think broadly the point that Evan makes about the focus being on political journalists and us leading the coverage, particularly in the early days, is a really valid one. But I think what we need to do is separate out the word coverage and look more, more broadly at what we've actually done here, because we are talking very much in the context of those daily press conferences. 
And that's because that's the window into our profession. It's what most people have seen. It's the bit that most people, for the most part, throughout the early days particularly, tuned into every day because this was a whole new thing and none of us really understood what was happening. While those have been happening, there has been a huge amount of other coverage. It's not just the press conferences. You know, there are daily packages if you're a TV journalist, those films at the top of every hour. There are broadcasts on the radio, there are special programmes, there's newspaper coverage, both local and national, from science correspondents, technology correspondents, politi political correspondents, the whole range. So I think we need to look a little bit more broadly when we're talking about the way this has been covered, because if you're talking very specifically about the press conferences, yes, you know, there are definitely questions. And I, I share Evan's point of view that actually political correspondence being the focus of those press conferences hasn't necessarily always been the right thing to do. But look at the other coverage too. That aside, if we are going to focus on those press conferences, because that is how most people did consume their news, then of course there are questions about the way that they have were conducted, about the questions that we've asked, about the tone particularly, I think. And that has come from, Evan, you mentioned it, the adversarial kind of way that political journalism usually operates. And that is a much broader question about the way that number 10 and really this number 10 operates with political journalists and how the two have worked together in previous months running up to this crisis and then throughout it. But I think the one thing I would say about, you know, is it worth talking about well beating when Boris Johnson says well beating? Is it worth talking about 100,000 tests a day when Matt Hancock raises it as a, as a target? I think it is worth doing that. And I think the reason it's worth doing that is because political journalism, when you look at it, when you look at how it's done, it's not necessarily a, a nice or attractive process to watch. It can be quite messy. It can look messy and it can look adversarial because the lobby and there are lots of criticisms of it, does work as a pack of journalists. And we inch forward bit by bit. You know, one person asks a bit of a question, the next person might ask the next bit, and eventually you hope that you're going to get to an answer. And it's slow and it's and it can look grubby, actually. And so doing that in public doesn't always look very good, but we are all working for the same result, which is ultimately to make sure that the government is held to account. So the reason for asking is it a well-beating test system? It's not necessarily because we all want to see the Prime Minister fail. It's because if you are the leader of this country in a global pandemic and you are promising a well-beating test system, somebody's going to have to hold your feet to the fire for that. And if you can't deliver it, then don't promise it. Because as Evan says, actually, most of the public are perfectly willing to accept that not everything is perfect. And I think if you're asking journalists to be honest about that and to, and to look at the way that we operate, then that has to go for politicians too. So Kate, actually, we've got a question from Anonymous. Hello, Anonymous, uh, which is just about whether you know journalists should in those press conferences have worked a bit more as a pack. So, you know, I know Alistair Campbell early on was incredibly critical that he thought the journalists weren't doing a good enough job in holding the government to account. Alistair, of course, would think that, wouldn't he? But <laughs> he thought that actually if they were prepared to pick up uh, the question of their predecessor, which had gone rather unanswered sometimes at that question, they would have been much more effective. Do you know how have you sort of worked those press conferences? You know, he anonymous thinks maybe you're just too keen on getting your clip to go into your bulletin, and that's what you're there for, rather than actually making sure that the prime minister or whoever is doing the press conference at the time is rigorously uh, examined. Well, so I've only been able to ask a question a couple of times at those press conferences. Generally, as you mentioned, it would be Beth, our political editor, or for the BBC, it would be Laura or a health editor or somebody else. So speaking from when I've done it, the journalists do coordinate in terms of making sure that we're not all asking the same question beforehand. We don't necessarily agree each, well, we don't agree each of those questions, we would never do that, but we do make sure that we're not all going to ask the same thing 10 times over because that would be really boring. There is though, you're right, a criticism about, um, about uh, broadcast journalists asking questions specifically for their film. Um, and that has come up before and it is a problem. And anybody who has watched press conferences throughout Brexit, you've been to Brussels, you've seen them, you will have seen the same question being asked about five times over. That is a criticism and a very, very valid one of our profession as broadcast journalists, and it's problematic. And I think in the early days, that was much more of a problem because when we first started covering this, none of us really knew how long it was gonna go on for. So there definitely was much more of a sense of, okay, we need the top clip for our package and it needs to be right. And this is the opportunity to do that. Now, you, you can look at that and you can think, well, that's a bit, you know, it's not really the right way to ask a question. You're right, but sometimes it's the only time you might actually get some time with the prime minister. So that's why that happens. 
I think in the later stages, though, that's been that's been very different, and there has been follow up. You know, the, the politicians have allowed us to ask follow up questions. Sometimes that hasn't happened. That makes it more difficult. But actually, over the as the as this has progressed, you've seen journalists saying, "Well, hang on, you didn't actually answer that question from Channel Four. Can I just pick that up?" And that goes back to my point about the the lobby working as a pack of journalists. That is how we traditionally work behind the scenes. You know, we will all ask questions to try and push the story on together. And some people say that is, you know, confirming biases and it means that we fall into groupthink. I personally would argue that it's the way that you push a story forward when it's really, really difficult sometimes to get any information out of the government. So, Tom, uh, you've got lots of readers when you're at The Sun. Uh, you hopefully will get lots of listens at Times Radio. One of the key things in managing the pandemic was that basically people trusted that the government was doing the right thing. Thing. I just wonder when you were covering all of this from the sun, were you thinking about your role both as reporting government failures as well as successes, but also about the need to have a, you know, a message that the public could understand? It's quite complicated stuff dealing with a pandemic, not naturally sort of fitable into the maybe the sun's usual style. And uh, but also, you know, people do need to think that the government has their interests at heart and has actually got a bit of a grip. So how did you balance that? I think it was really difficult and you probably hit up upon the, the, the nub of all our problems, all this. And I, I would and I agree a lot of what Evan said. I agree a lot of what Kate said. Um, I probably come in from a slightly uh, different take in that I think we're getting better at it now in that we're able to perspectivize what's happening with this pandemic, where it's going. At, at the start of it, and Kate's point uh, is absolutely valid, none of us knew what was going on. I mean, it we really was evolving day by day how serious it is. What is this actual disease? So uh, we did come at it from uh, an, an essentially political take to begin with. I think Evan's right about that. But I would just unpack that a tiny bit before I answer your question a bit more directly mm -hmm. to say that the backdrop to how we came into this is really worth remembering. And it was off the back of Brexit. It was off the back of a, a government that was really at war with some elements of the media, uh, and some elements of broadcast media, especially, and, and perhaps small elements of the press. You may or may not remember, but there was a, there was a it feels like a microscopic, pathetic, pathetic little episode now mm -hmm. compared to what we've all been through. Uh, but only a few weeks before the pandemic hit, there was a famous incident in Downing Street where a lot of, um, Political journalists came in for a briefing, uh, some invited, some not, uh, and we were separated on the carpet of the of the, the, the main entrance hall of number 10 itself uh, to those who are welcome, those who weren't welcome, those who weren't welcome were told to leave. Uh, what ended up having all of us left uh, in, in protest, uh, not because we're, we're some, we act as a union, it was more sporadic. I think if we had tried to organise that in advance, it would have failed because, you know, we all like to fight each other, really. But I say that because coming into this whole thing, there was a lot of baggage. Number 10 had baggage on us, some of us had baggage on number 10, and it was a very hostile, febrile environment. I think I'm right, Evan maybe will correct me, in saying that there was an active number 10 boycott on the Today programme, right up to the to the, to the the beginning of the pandemic. I think there was certainly on some of Sky News, uh, GMB got their own pandemic boycott in the middle of it all. Uh, so. Journalists had issues with, with, with number 10, with the, the communications people, number 10 and politicians. And that was a really bad environment to begin covering a massive public health crisis. Uh, point, point number one. Uh, to address your, your direct point, yes, you do have responsibilities to your readers. You have to tell the story. And I think we all really struggled. I think we're better at it now. Getting the balance right between public health information because we played a crucial role uh, and we still do in simply telling people what the government thinks and thereby all their best scientists and best medical protectionists what to do to keep themselves safe and that's an absolutely crucial uh, bit of communication because if we weren't doing it and you weren't like enough to go to twitter and find boris johnson's tweets then you wouldn't know whether to isolate or shield or whatever it might be uh, so uh, we had to balance that with our traditional job, which we really have to do, I think we did reasonably well of, of holding the government to account at the same time. And uh, I'm just going to pick on one final thing, trying to make this too winding uh, an answer, but we struggled, I think, to get that balance right. What I would defend is 
that it was a political story from the beginning and continuing to. And that doesn't mean that there aren't a massively important role for science correspondents and health correspondents to play. And, and I think they've excelled in this crisis where I don't think the political lobby necessarily have excelled. I think we've done a decent job. I think we've fallen down on, on various elements. I think there was um, probably too much confrontation, uh, certainly uh, uh, to begin with. But in defence of the lobby leading this story or political journalists leading this story, uh, to understand political journalism, I think it's important to remember that we are all generalists. Uh, across politics, there are 14 government ministries, God knows how many quangos, and it covers the full spectrum of the entirety of life in Britain, because that's what the government has to govern effectively, although some people wish they wouldn't govern all parts of it. So we're not really specialists in everything. We have to be across all different uh, specialisms. One day it's agriculture, the next day it's defence, and, and now it's health. So I think we can come at it from a slightly better perspective in terms of representing what the viewers and the readers want, <laughs> Uh, in terms of being every man rather than being an obsessive about health and obsessive uh, about scientists. The, the important thing we can bring, this is my final point of promise, is that we know politicians. We know, uh, we think anyway, we, we think we know when they're misleading. We think we, we know by a flick of the eyebrow or, or an intonation of their voice or certain language they use, which we study incredibly closely, obsessively day in, day out. We think we know when they're leading us the garden path and when they're giving to us straight. And I think we have some ability at doing that and therefore when the prime minister is trying to tell us something especially when he's trying to defend a, a, a difficult period in, in the government's life then i think we're best placed to, to hold him to account i hope that answers you I, probably I answers 15 other different you questions that. you said that it's interesting you said that tom because Petrina finch has asked a question saying actually you know feet pointing out that there were times when people at those press conferences failed to pick up you know clear errors or misstatements or slightly misleading statements from the Prime Minister and stuff like that and wondered whether it was fair of the public to expect, as you say, generalist journalists to pick up on somebody being slightly misleading on some statistical thing or whatever. Do you think that's a, a fair criticism you'd recognise? Uh, I'm sure it, it did happen because uh, that's the downside of journalism. You, you can't spot the, the misplaced decimal point. But then again, I would argue that the, the, the better argument is holding the Prime Minister account and, and spotting where he is uh, going wrong or going right or, or whatever it is. Uh, on the whole, I think the media did a decent job uh, in, in covering this uh, and we're still we're getting better as, as it goes on. There were definitely flaws. Uh, there were definitely problems with it. And I think we, as a group of political journalists or as a group of different media organisations, did slightly come at it uh, 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 wrong. I think we were at times too hostile to the government, uh, not really understanding that this was a brand new global phenomenon, but also at times um, it, some of our organisations were, were a little bit too complimentary. And when did things did go wrong, we weren't um, you know, willing to, to call it out. It, th this whole pandemic has challenged all of us, government, but also media, unlike anything I've ever seen before. You know, this is not, I mean, it, it's up there, we're trying to report on a war, which I've, you know, we've all done as well. You know, it's a brand new thing. There are no rules. We were trying to make it up as we were going along and undoubtedly we failed, uh, but it wasn't for any you know, lack of attempt or any, any bad will. I think hey, perhaps uh, some egotism came into play um, wrongly uh, with people getting their moment and wanting to uh, utilize that. But, um, you know, we're all human. We've all got egos at the end of the day, so I'd even be prepared to forgive that in the wider picture. OK, and Jen, covering this from Manchester for the Manchester Evening News, you know, you've got this, you know, in the early stage, you had a daily set piece down in London. Uh, you got to ask some questions sometimes through video, but how hard was it to actually, you know, get that sort of, you know, central local angle that you needed up in Manchester um, you know did you think that actually the stuff coming out of London really wasn't very useful locally? Um, well I think the first thing I'd probably say is that if you're going to be covering this anywhere in England outside of London then you probably want to be doing it in Manchester and I've, I've kind of been fortunate in that we've got a setup here where you both have a degree of devolution so different bits of the, uh, the system talk to each other which means that if you talk to somebody in a council, that they may be able to tell you what's going on uh, in the NHS as well and, and vice versa, which makes my life much easier because you get more of a kind of 360 picture of what's happening across different um, different 
um, frontline aspect of the way that the pandemic was playing out. And I suppose the second thing is that we have got uh, Andy Burnham, who's been particularly high profile um, in terms of being a voice uh, of the, the English regions uh, during the pandemic, which then means that you've got, you know, if, if, if there's something happening in Greater Manchester during this, there is at least a slightly better chance that it's going to have a bit of national attention because you've got a particularly media savvy mayor, but you've also got a mayor who used to be health secretary. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that puts um, kind of covering it in Greater Manchester in a different place to if perhaps you're trying to do it in another part of England. So I've been quite conscious that I've been quite fortunate in, in that respect. I think um, Evan talked about defaulting to the story being a political story. I would also say that uh, during a lot of this, things have defaulted to it being a central story and a central narrative. And the way that the government has handled it overlaps to some extent with the way that the media has then covered it. So if you take care homes as an example, um, you know, the NHS was quite clearly the government's priority early on and care homes was sort of took a bit of a, a, a back foot as we as we sort of saw later in the pandemic. And equally, many of the questions that were most of the press or questions that were coming up at those press conferences in the early days um, were about the NHS as opposed to about social care. If you're covering it at a local level, you're looking at it through the other end of the telescope. So I was spending a lot more time talking to people about care homes than I was about hospitals, although I was having that conversation as well, which meant that to me, from where I was sitting, there seemed to be a kind of glaring lack of uh, conversation, let's say, uh, about social care. And that's partly a function of the way that those two systems operate in this country. It's partly a function of the NHS being totemic in a way that social care isn't. It's partly a function of even the government, I suspect itself, having less of an understanding in some respects of social care and public health than they do about the kind of big, chunky, acute care, ventilators, all of that stuff. And even from talking to people on the public health side at a local level who have said within the Department of Health, there is probably less of a really good understanding of public health than there is about the acute sector. So that all kind of plays out into into what you what you end up with. So I mean, you know, and and part of that is is you saw to some extent played out um, in in the media coverage. I think um, for me, one of the big difficulties was no matter how many people I spoke to in Greater Manchester who knew what they were talking about they were not getting the information that they needed from government so i would i would ring somebody and think oh this person will be able to tell me what's going on with this and they'll be like no i don't know i don't know why the government's doing this i don't know why the government's not doing that um you know we only sorted out the the issue with data flow on patient identifiable data a couple of weeks ago and that had been going on for months and months and months um the politu testing stuff went on for months before that got resolved and all the time I would be asking the same people the same questions. And I, I still got to the point where I felt bad about it because I would be kind of going, but why? And they would say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I cannot get the Department of Health to tell me. I don't know why the ministers are taking this decision. I don't know whether this is something to do with it. some contract out there, which it is impossible to scrutinise because of emergency uh, COVID le legislation. It meant that although I had quite a clear picture of what was happening on the ground, I couldn't always answer the question why, and neither could very often our politicians here or um, or officials here. I guess the, the final thing I would say is that um, data and statistics, uh, you know, I'm political correspondent, I'm not a health correspondent, uh, I've had to hit the ground running on that and learn things as I've gone along. And I think getting the balance between understanding it well enough to translate it to your readers and equally not pretending that you're suddenly an expert in it is quite a tricky, quite a tricky balance. And not trying to kind of overplay the analysis and say to people, this means X, when actually, do you know that that means X? Because are you really an expert in that? And I think that's been something that probably journalists at every level in every part of the country have been sort of learning as they go along. And that's that's definitely been a challenge, I would say. And I'm still finding it a challenge now. Um, yeah. So I just want to pick up that. I think that's a really interesting point, sir. I mean, clearly one of the challenges, and Evan might come to you on this, is the sort of, you know, what's England, what's actually being done 
at regions, it's right to you know ask Andy Burnham to what's going on or somebody else. What's different in Scotland and Wales? How on earth do you get across this sort of diversity of response in a programme that I think is supposed to be a UK wide programme? Uh, no, I listen to PM. Uh, well, I think you're trying to be UK wide uh, when all these different things and quite often at the early stage, the government was really quite bad about when it was speaking for England and when it was speaking as the UK. Well, I think when the inquiry is done, we will find <laughs> that is one of the issues that comes up is the relationship between devolved and uh, Westminster governments. Um, and I think that question is a good one for the media as well. If I'm honest, I think most of the time we have defaulted to England. Um, that is because 90 percent of the, the country is England. And in the end, you you kind of you follow that. I think where we've been quite good is pointing out that it's England. Where we've not been good is in giving lots of coverage to what's going on in the in the other jurisdictions. I mean, I think that's perhaps changed. I, I, I'll, I'll bang on about my old theme again. As the as the Scottish situation has become more of a more political concern and interest, um, kind of, oh my goodness, this really is going to lead to a referendum, and Scotland's going to leave. Look at the polls. As, as that has sort of risen up the political agenda, suddenly the whole Scotland dynamic has become a much bigger one. But in the early part of the pandemic, it was in, it was hard enough to keep track of what was going on in um, in, in England. And um, so, you know, frankly, watching the Scottish, I didn't really have time to watch the Nicola Surgeon briefings other than just to read the very quick sort of headlines from it in a way that we were kind of then presenting the the, the, the afternoon government briefing as, as a very big deal. So look, I think that is a really interesting one. Mm. Um, and I, I think it is very tricky. And it, it's very tricky when you have things like governments trying to present different messages, different mm. governments presenting mm. different messages, because what are you meant to say? Stay at home if you live south of this line and, 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 and go out if you live north of this one. It's, it's not it's not easy. Mm. We've done a little bit of that, but I think there may be some tidying up in, in, in all parts of the UK's government and media to, uh, to, to, to sort of smooth the lines there a bit. So, no, that's very interesting. Another question we had for, actually from somebody, uh, somebody commented on the nature of our panel was on the lack of diversity they were commenting on the panel, but let's extrapolate from that to a lack of diversity in the media. Clearly, one of the big COVID stories has been the very differential effect <coughs> of COVID on black and ethnic minority communities and also the very steep social gradient. Uh, we saw a bit of that on Brexit when people were very out of touch with a lot of the country and the metropolitan media has taken some grief on that. Um, you know, uh, I don't know what anyone would like to pick up whether the sort of you know media coverage has been less rich than it might be because basically it's a lot of quite samey people doing the media who just sort of float float around. Anyone like to have a go at that? Tom, you're nodding. Oh, I was <laughs> I was laughing along. I wasn't uh, volunteering, but um, if you've um, think so me, you're volunteering. Um, now. I would I'd reject that. I really would. I mean, you know. Who has been championing all these reports that have been written, whether it's you know, Resolution Foundation or various health think tanks or, or government reports or committee reports into the you know shocking uh, disproportionate effect it's had on baby communities, whether it's the virus itself or the economic effects, which are uh, may well prove you know far more judgmental. Uh, it's us. It's all of us. It's it's all us. You know, uh, non-diverse panel here, which is by the way picked by the IFG, not us. No, um, no. So. Well, one back at you there, Jill. Uh, no, but I, I think I think to suggest that um, you can't have empathy or sympathy uh, or natural, you know, human curiosity and feeling uh, because you don't share someone's uh, racial demographics is ridiculous. Uh, and that's not to say that our profession should be more diverse, which it really should be. And I think all of us are trying in our own little ways to try and improve that. Our various organisations, uh, but. That doesn't mean to say we can't do a very good job reporting on precisely the sorts of issues. OK, anyone else want to come in that, Jen? Yeah, I just think that it does matter, actually, um, 
what the range of backgrounds is uh, of the people that are covering anything, including a pandemic. And I think the same thing goes for the people who are taking the decisions. And certainly for me, watching the politicians who are taking the decisions all coming from a very similar background, um, you know, same ethnicity, same gender in most cases, uh, that has, I've certainly felt that there has been other ways of thinking and other perspectives that have been missing from decision making. So there's no reason to think that that's not the case the way that it would be reported as as well. I think that it's it can be quite difficult to identify what's missing until it's there, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I can see when perspectives are missing as a woman or somebody from Manchester or I'm Welsh. So I notice when the devolved nations are not represented. You know, I imagine if you're from a BME uh, background, you can see when uh, other perspectives are missing. And I think, you know, as a profession, as so many other areas of public health, uh, public life in this country, um, I think it's poorer for being um, uh, for being, sorry, there's an enormous insect flying in front of my face. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's poorer for, 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 for being uh, less diverse, perhaps, than it could be. Um, Kate, we've got a question here from Penny. Sorry, can I yeah, can yeah. I just come in on that one? Because yeah. I do want to I do want to say I, I think it's just it's more than just colour and BME. I think there's a lot of ways in which the the, the media class are not representative. And I I mean I you know I I think of someone I know who lives in a flat with four kids, no garden, and you, you, the, the lockdown experience is just very, very different. And mm. I was aware sometimes we were sort of talking about things you might do in lockdown in your garden. And we just have to be very, very careful of those those kinds of assumptions that people are living are living like us. But I would say, Jill, and I, I sort of echo Tom here, I do think most of us are very aware of the gaps yeah whether it's class or background or, or, or ethnic heritage, I think it's, I think most of us are aware we do make a big, a big, big effort to overcome that. So when statistics come out on BME incidents of COVID, we don't ignore it. We're, we're, we're sort of right on it, I think, by and large. I just want to go to Kate. We've got a question from Penny Wright, which is basically about science. She's asked, have individual scientists had open access to you to raise points that might not be covered by the official network? And obviously, you know, this is probably more for your science specialists. But I'm quite interested when you have a battle between scientists and it's not clear, you know, you've got David King and his independent sage and his bunch of respected epidemiologists saying one thing and then you appear to have Chris Whitty, Patrick Vallance uh, saying something else. How on earth do you manage to make sense of really quite a technical, you know, quite dry but extraordinarily important set of choices that poor ministers are having to navigate all this competing, competing set of views? What do you what do you do with all of that? Well, what you've just described is what political journalists do every single day, not with science necessarily, but as Tom said, it could be any number of different things because our entire life is made up of people telling us different things about the same topic. Some people may well tell you black is blue and you have to, your entire job is to decipher whether or not they're telling you the truth, why they might, might, why they might want to tell you that truth. So, you know, there might be a reason why somebody is suddenly becoming very forthcoming about something. The whole job of a political journalist, I'm sure it's true for every other profession, is that you have to decipher the information you're given. So when it comes to the science, it's the exactly the same principles, it's just a different subject. So it is more difficult and Jen made this point, and I think there is a much more, there's a much broader thing to explore here, which is that none of us really understood how complicated the link between the NHS, Public Health England, councils, social care. I mean, my God, if one thing is clear out of this pandemic, it is that social care is the most fractured nonsensical system and by the way we are all going to have to rely on this it is a pressing issue it is the most it's the biggest political hot potato if we are not still talking about this I mean it that that for me is the biggest thing but the science has been more difficult because obviously it's moved so quickly none of us are natural science reporters you know some of us may not have a natural affinity with numbers and um, that might not come easily it doesn't come easily to me so yeah, you have to learn very quickly, but what you do is you take all the information that you're given, you speak to all the sources you can possibly speak to, and then you try and collate it. And, and if you still don't understand, you ring an expert, you ring your science correspondent, you speak to the people in the room, you sense check it, you speak to other journalists and you say, you know, does that, 
does that sound right to you? Because it doesn't sound right to me. That's how that's how this job works. That's how political journalism works. And that's what we've applied to the science. But I think one of the things that we missed in the early stages mm -hmm. of this, and, and, it, and Tom has said it, Evan said it, was that we were very quick to rely, when a scientist said something was happening, we were very, very quick to rely on that as being the one truth of the situation. And I think what none of us appreciated until maybe even very recently is that actually no one scientist will tell you that there is a definitive answer to any of these questions and there never has been. So reporting on it is really, really difficult. And like Tom says, you know, in the early stages, our job was to get information out there quickly and it had to be reliable. And so you are you are relying on people who are experts telling you, I mean, masks is a great example of that, right? I mean, the World Health Organization still hasn't changed its guidance on wearing masks. This is the World Health Organization. You know, this country, the, our politicians in this country have been criticised for being late to the table when it comes to wearing masks. But, you know, there are still lots of people who are suggesting it isn't the right thing to do. This is what happens when science happens in real time. It is messy. It's complicated. But I think I go back to the point I made at the beginning. If we are honest with our audiences, if we give them the information that we have, the accurate filtered information that we can give them and we present it honestly, that is all that we can do faithfully in a pandemic like this. That is all we can do. And I think I, I can say that's what I have been trying to do. And I think I don't know any journalist who hasn't. I think we all have. And I think that's why it feels messy and sometimes why it feels frustrating. Did you, let ministers, did you let ministers get away too long for saying we're just following the science? Because, you know, in the early stages, that was the dominant mantra throughout. I think that I think I go back to what I said, which was that, you know, in the early stages, I don't think we fully understood that following the science wasn't a coherent point of view. I don't think I certainly didn't necessarily understand that you know, the way that SAGE works was hugely competing points of view and lots of different arguments and actually filtering that to present to the public is is really hard for politicians to do and then really hard for us to try and communicate. So maybe we did. Maybe we didn't question fully what actually that means because we didn't really understand what it means. But I will say one thing, which is that journalists have been criticised for allowing politicians to say that we are relying on the science, but we're also being criticised for being too critical of them of making their decisions and we're being too critical for asking why we didn't lock down sooner and why there wasn't enough PPE you know that it can't it can't work both ways right you have to you, you can't we can't I know it's very difficult and nobody wants to hear us saying that we're trying our best but I genuinely think that that's what we were doing it probably can work both ways I just want to come on to, I'm afraid <laughs> probably probably can, yeah. but anyway I think you're all going to be uh be being browbeaten by everybody there was um one uh former colleague of mine sort of wanted me to ask a question which was you know maybe to Tom was the newspapers seem to be very gung-ho for the government to lift lockdown quite quickly uh, and perhaps getting ahead of their readers you know all the polling suggested the public were much more compliant but suggesting people were fatigued uh, with lockdown and needed to get out and it was liberation day and things like that yeah, you know, was that at all dictated by your sort of you know, marketing team saying, for God's sake, nobody's going out and buying a paper. We need to get this, get rid of this lockdown as soon as we can. Just going to put that one to Tom as a very quick question. And I've got well, what a suggestion, Jill. No, I don't think marketing. There's a real uh, strong uh, literal war between marketing and editorial. And uh, try and be a marketing. Uh, official and going taking an edit of what they should be writing it really never works um, and, and they never dare. Uh, what I think we did struggle from is all our readers and viewers at the beginning had the same feeling which is my god this is what is this thing we're, we're terrified by it so we could all report the same thing with, with some comfort which is let's all take action quickly to try and you know protect our health. As the lockdown continued quite quickly the country split into three and polls show this uh, there were the roughly a third of the country thought the government doing a decent job uh, and were uh, unlocking or locking at the right sort of speed. A third who thought they were going too slowly and desperately wanted to unlock, who might have been you know, more represented by some readers who are in their inherent nature, white van man, they're small businessmen, they want to get out and, and, and work because they don't have to stay paying their, their salary. And then there was a third of the country who uh, thought the government were unlocking too fast and were scared. And I think every newspaper has all those three types of readers and it's incredibly hard 
to get a balance uh, and, and represent the views of all three. When the current, the country mm -hmm. rather, is split three different ways and you're trying to represent readers from all different groups or listeners or whatever it is, uh, it becomes incredibly difficult to tell one uh, single story with, with one straightforward narrative, which is which we all strive to do. Jen, there are a few occasions when the sort of you know big news was sort of you know overtaken by what you might describe as more personal news. Um, uh, the week in which Boris Johnson was uh, was ill was clearly very big news, but it was also news when there's some really terrible figures coming through on death rates and uh, things like that, which you know went slightly lower down. I think the Sun you know celebrated its Good News Friday on a day when you know it was not quite the peak of deaths, but it was pretty near over Boris Johnson. Uh, we had the big obsession with Dominic Cummings, um, which you could argue contributed in its own way to people thinking actually I've got license to break the rules, but it was clearly a great story. But uh, do you think you know we've consistently got our news values right here on what we've covered? We seem to be more willing to cover deaths in Spain and Italy than we were to cover the numbers in the UK? I think, um, I mean, certainly from our perspective, I think we did all of those things. Um, I mean, the, one of the things about the area that we live in, in the digital era, is that you can see what people are reading. And something I've kind of noticed is that it's like a bit, a bit like what Tom was just saying, there's, there's uh, a chunk of our audience, I think, who are looking for one set of stuff. And then there's another chunk of our audience, and I'm sure there'll be an overlap in this, who are looking uh, for another set of stories. Sometimes it kind of seemed to me, particularly at that point where it was kind of, will they, won't they release the lockdown, that there was kind of stories that kind of confirmed that that was dangerous would be really, really well read. But also stories that said uh, the pubs are opening in three weeks, would also be really well read because there was one lot of people looking for those stories and another lot of people looking for those stories. And I've noticed it on social media, too, that there has been, you know, I mean, I did a piece one week that said that hospital admissions had had a slight uptick in Greater Manchester. And the story went wild. It just went absolutely wild because I think there were, there were a lot of people out there who were sort of waiting for that. They were looking, they were looking for the statistics to show what they were worried about. And then equally, you could do a live blog on the pubs reopening in North Manchester, and that would go completely wild as well, because lots of people are really up for that. So I think, I mean, I, I basically, I agree with Tom. I think it's difficult to kind of get that balance right. So we've we've kind of tried to do all of it in equal measure. And I, I hope that we've got it about about right. But I think all journalists are kind of facing similar dilemmas and all, all, all editorial teams are, are facing similar dilemmas. Evan. Jill, when, when we judge the media's response mm. to this crisis, the real test is, is have all the significant stories got out there, got exposure, mm. and have people who need those stories had access to them? And this is the one area in which I think mm. the messy ecosystem mm -hmm. in which we operate of competing and cooperating journalists and a dominant BBC and the role of TV and tabloid papers mm. grappling with the issues of the different types mm. of tastes of their readers. Out of all that mess, I think the one thing you can say the media has done is cover mm. everything about this story. Now, it may be that I'm only saying that because all the things we haven't covered, other things I don't know about, and are, they're still there. But I would be interested if any of the people watching this could cite some aspect mm. of COVID that has not been given exposure, like BME, you know, B differential BME infections and deaths, or the, uh, you know, PPE testing in care homes. These are these are the very obvious ones that were covered. But I think, by and large, what the media has done between itself, okay. not every outlet, but between itself, is is actually found all those angles and sought okay. them out and given them exposure. And that is, you know, that is a really Mm. That is what is strong about our ecosystem, mm. media ecosystem. Some of it adversarial will find things that the non-adversarial mm. media won't find. Some of the science journals will find stuff that the poll cores won't find. But I think between us all, we do have to say the angles have been covered. At least that's my impression. That's my impression. Okay. Yeah, I agree. And I was just going to say, you know, you, you mentioned in the question or the person who, who put the question about the coverage of Italy. I actually think that if you think back to the early days, 
Sky, I'm going to do a little plug here, <laughs> did the most amazing coverage of inside Italian hospitals and the, the images of, you know, this is a really well run healthcare system, you know, by and large, one of the most well funded and well run in the world. And you saw inside this hospital of people inside these bubbles, you know, these these breathing bubbles and corridors full of people. And I think coverage like that really brought home to people that actually this isn't just something that we maybe don't need to be that worried about. This is something that could really hit home hard here. And doing that, showing those stories that maybe don't necessarily apply to you right now is just as important as as what Jen says, which yeah. is, you know, talking to people about the pubs opening in Manchester or, or hospital spikes in particular regions in the country, showing people what's happening outside of yeah. your own bubble gives you the context to understand how important what we're dealing with is, I think. I get I get Evan's point about news omnivores will have got everything if they sort of, you know, read lots and lots of different things. But most people probably just turn on one thing and notice what's leading the news and stuff like that. Just just a question back is uh, just UK is did the Dominic Cummings story did you just beat the living daylights out of the Dominic Cummings story because, you know, it's a great personality story. It's a bit of light relief. And things like that or uh, uh, do you think that people got that out of proportion? I think it's probably partly what Tom was saying about the context for going into reporting this um, for, from a political journalism perspective. You know if you think about the relationship between this number 10 and, and journalists at that point in time it was very fractured and you mentioned Jill at the start of this conversation about the restructuring of the way that communications works inside mm -hmm. government and that's going to have a huge impact on the way that political journalism works because we know that there is an intention to cut down you know the number of press offices in government departments mm -hmm. to really centralize communications and when you do that if you are going to gatekeep who has access to information that is something that really worries journalists and we, we hate that idea obviously we hate the idea of being shut out of anything we're nosy that's that's what we do but you know that that is that was the context for starting to report this so i think some of it's probably about that but i do think that there was a wider point with the dominic Cummings story which was that actually there were a lot of people around the country who were really suffering and all of us will have been in situations where we couldn't see family you know we were very worried about family and friends you know we were going out of our way to do things to protect people and then you saw somebody who was effectively helping to write the policy not sticking to the rules and if there's one thing that British journalism really hates it's that sense of unfairness right it's that sense of hang on a minute what are you that's that's not fair and that's why that story got so much coverage and I'll tell you why it continued to get so much coverage was the way that it was handled by government, you know, the, the, the way that they approached the handling of it, which eventually resulted in that weird press conference in the Rose Garden in Downing Street, which was unprecedented, completely unprecedented. Um, so, yeah, so I don't think, I mean, I, I don't think it was, I think some people would say there was a lot of commentary around it, which was, which was very, you know, personal perhaps, but if you're just talking about journalism and political journalists and not commentators, if you take them out of the equation, I think the way it was covered was probably um, was probably fair. So that was a great segue, Kate, into where I wanted to go in the sort of final few minutes, which is what do we think about, this is number 10 that has handled the press in quite a confrontational way, it's done selective leaking, continued a bit of that. Some people have said it's sort of basically been uh, treating COVID a bit like a campaign. Uh, and now we see these new changes with the uh, the ad, if anyone wants to apply for the government spokesman, has just gone live on the Conservatives website. So get your applications in uh, by the end of August if you're interested. Um, I'm going to ask the panel whether any of them are applying. But I just want to say, yeah, what was this told us about how number 10 handles the daily press conferences? And what's your expectation of what the new setup is going to be like? You know, Jen, are you looking forward to daily Prime Minister's news briefings and uh, things like that? How's uh, How do you think the new arrangement is going to work? Kate's worried about the centralisation of press officers. So I think that um, if you go back to the Downing Street briefings during the pandemic, I think one good thing to have come from that was that on every one and on some occasions more than more, there was more than one uh, regional journalist asking a question, which I think for me was um, was quite healthy. And I, 
it felt as though there was a bit more of a kind of uh, balance in what they were being scrutinised on now. I mean, I appreciate there are there are original journalists in the lobby, but I think that um, on the on the one hand, if it means that there is a little bit more levelling out of a few more regional voices being able to ask questions directly of the prime minister, um, and obviously I am talking about me, but I don't just mean don't just mean me. Um, then that's then that's a good thing. I think that um, more broadly, I would share Kate's concern about centralisation um, of communications. I've watched some things happen during the pandemic around the sheer aggressiveness of uh, government comms when you write a story that they don't like. Um, I've had conflicting, I mean, if you just take the data stories that I've done, the, a whole series of statements from the Department of Health, which were kind of fairly contradictory. It came close to being untrue at points mm. where it felt very difficult to kind of get a handle on that. It was very difficult from my perspective to kind of really hold that to account. And I and it it felt to me that a lot of what was sitting behind some of those conflicting messages and aggressive messages was gatekeeping um the dictating of the response from number 10, um, the dictating of the message from number 10. So if what they're doing now is a kind of ramping up and an acceleration of that, that would very much, that would worry me and that doesn't seem particularly healthy. Um, but yeah, I think I'm probably less qualified to answer that question than the other people are on the panel. Tom, do, what do you think of this new arrangement? Uh, and you're named as one of the possible runners and riders in this spectator, though, as you were pointing out, you're only slightly shorter odds than Emily Maitlis, so perhaps that doesn't put you in the front <laughs> line. Of, uh, of runners there? Well, they missed out the two obvious contenders on that list, which is Evan Davis and Kate McCann. Um, uh, and uh, no, it's not for me. Uh, you're a tomato thrower, you're a tomato catcher in life, as someone once told me, and I don't know which one I am. It's, I'm not very good at catching. Um, I, I don't have a problem with this, uh, with one major caveat. I think the government opening itself up to scrutiny uh, on a public forum for everyone to see is, is it has to be a good thing. Scrutiny and transparency has to work and as long as, and here's the crucial caveat, it's not at the loss of something else such as the morning lobby briefings for the Prime Minister's official spokesman which we have every morning apart from in recess and then it goes down to, to once a week. So uh, it, it's great. I have a oh, look there's a cat that's just joined us. Um, <laughs> This is a shameful attempt to try and wrestle the, the microphone away, Kate McCann. This is what TV people do. Um, I have kittens and they want, to, they want to get involved. I'm sorry. It's OK. I've been managing two small dogs. One is mine and one is my sister-in-law's. I'm having to look after them. One's barking. Uh, anyway, my point being, I've completely forgotten it, but I think I probably made it. I was going to go on to say another point about um, the spokesman. Uh, yes, the downside for the government is, of course, on days that, they, that, that, that are difficult for them. And they have difficult things to defend. Uh, and we you know we sit through these lobby briefings and the Prime Minister spokesman doesn't actually answer the question, doesn't answer our points because there is no answer because it's a difficult thing for the government. That, uh, when they're on television doing that, is going to be really, really uncomfortable. And for we can understand it because we understand the government sometimes don't have all the answers. I think they're going to make that a difficult thing to explain, possibly to uh, the wider public. Or maybe not, I, I don't know. But I think it's, on the whole, uh, I approve of it. OK, Kate and Kat, will you be carrying the daily press briefing on Sky News every every day? Have you made your minds up about that yet? It's certainly not for me to decide. I would have thought so, because as Tom says, you know, if, if any opportunity for the government to be put in front of a camera and to be asked questions of is a really good thing, because it means that people get to see, you know, the answers in real time. We get to ask the questions of the day in real time. I mean, the context for this is obviously that in political journalism, there is a lobby briefing every morning anyway, which is not on camera and is on the record, but only after it's finished. So you don't get to see the process behind it. All political journalists can ask questions. If you're in the lobby, nobody is excluded. Um, but obviously putting it on camera puts the government in a different position because it means that they are going to have to answer. And sometimes things will be very difficult and that might look messy for them. My worry about it is that it either becomes, as Evan has said, you know, there are sometimes egos involved. My worry is that it becomes a chance for people to try and look intelligent, which I think would actually be really bad for our profession. And my other concern about it is that it becomes a bit of a circus and it becomes a bit of a kind of 
you know, if the government is not going to use it to give answers, if they are going to use it to effectively, you know, do their own propaganda, then that's a really bad thing. And then that means that there is a, a difficult decision for Sky and other broadcasters to make about whether you carry it live, because it's not our job to broadcast government propaganda. It is our job to hold them to account. So it's going to be a really difficult balance. I'm interested to see and I'm, I'm open to it. Um, but I'm, I'm concerned about, about the way it will go. I hope that we will all use it properly. I'm so sorry about this. I don't know what she <laughs> wants. We love the cat. We love the cat. Uh, can I, can I just... final words on that, because we're about to come up. And um, you started off by carrying those press conferences in quite a lot of detail, and then you seemed to give up on them a bit and thought they were well, becoming we, dull. Uh, I mean, and one, of the the... one of the downsides of a daily briefing is that the the need to have something to say. The existence of the briefing drives the announcements and that you make up announcements mm. in order to fill a briefing. And I think I, I think in the end, I could see the, the appeal of a, a daily briefing because it was a clear, you know, a, a clear mark of, of, of what was happening and gave structure to the day. But I think in the end, we didn't need a daily briefing. I think probably three times a week would have been a, a, a better frequency. And I, I slightly worry that that's where we'll go. But for me, the... The story of this in terms of government comms is that they have been at their best when they have been completely upfront and frank and they have been at their worst when they've been too defensive. And and this is maybe a sort of bringing me back to where I started. The, the very, very slight worry, I think, about the, if you like, the, the excessive adversarialism, if we can call it that, is that it doesn't get the best out of government by holding them to account. It means you get made up targets, which are then made up figures to meet the target <laughs> in order to sort of serve the beast rather than rather than a kind of constructive dialogue. Now, I, I, I'm a big defender of adversarial journalism. I think it, I think it does work, incidentally. I think I think you want a bit of both. Um, but I slightly worry that at times this government has has felt it can't level with the public. Uh, because it's scared of being pounced on. Mm. And honestly, I think the public through this have shown enormous maturity and understanding of the challenge, the complexity, the, 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 the uncertainties that have been ha the hallmarks of this story. We have been reporting in the fog of war. The politicians have been governing in the fog of war and the public have entirely understood that. And, you know, when the press and the politicians together can sort of get the tone of we're in this fog, we're not running this particularly ideologically at the moment, it's just all about trying to make the best decisions in complicated circumstances. When, they've, when they have been able to get that tone right, they have done a better job for themselves. I'm not applying for their, mm. for their, their <laughs> speaker job, but, but I hope whoever they get picks that tone because it will serve them incredibly well on the difficult days that, that Tom has mentioned if they have been, you know, very upfront about the the mistakes they've made, the uncertainties, and they haven't oversold with words like world beating. Um, they haven't oversold themselves on the uh, on the less difficult days. So I think I think you know it's a real test mm. of whether they can get someone who doesn't see their job as to sort of kick journalists' ass, but is more about constructive dialogue with the country. I, I really hope that's the way the way they choose to do it. Okay, well that's a brilliantly positive note to end on and some very helpful tips for any of you who are thinking of applying and what you might make as your pitch to be the number 10 spokesman and perhaps change the tone of this government's handling of the media as we go forward and as we've learned. Thank everybody for lots of questions that came in. I hope I picked the spirit of at least some of them and uh, and that's just to wind it up. So if you want to listen again or recommend to your friends, it will be available on video and please keep watching IFG Live for other events as we all make it through lockdown together. Thank you very much. And thanks very much to our very <laughs> excellent panel. Bye. And Bye.